Sofia Coppola is one of the most interesting filmmakers I have ever come across. Even her so-called bad movies are quite comfortable watch for me. I finished her filmography last year and honestly disappointed to not have that 100% mark on her page because of some short films you can find nowhere but let's forget about that. I'm even glad to watch her one minute advertisement for Miss Dior which I would give a 3.5 out of 5 which was on Letterboxd for a short while but now it doesn't. Anyway. Her other vital short films are New York City Ballet, a film about the artists of New York City Ballet returning to perform almost over a year later because of Covid lockdown and it's pretty comfortable and beautiful to look at their magnetic moves for a quarter of an hour. Then there is her first singular short film League the Stars about a group of young girls plotting something with their code name League the Stars. I don't remember how it was but it's her least engaging film, although I would like to rewatch this and probably will find it fetching. Then there is A Very Merry Christmas, a Christmas special film starring Bill Murray as the tired star not wanting to be social at Christmas but everyone is pushing him to be. This is a musical and a harmless film of an hour that I surprisingly enjoyed. Now let's get to her feature length movies. Oh yeah, what are you gonna do with a gun? I don't know. What? You're not gonna shoot me with Can it. Can you not grab me, brother? I scared. Stop it. You just push a girl? Number 7. The Bling Ring The Bling Ring is really a good guilty pleasure film. The slight cringy beats are the best parts about it and it's even based on a true story which I didn't know until creating this list. The story is of a group of teenagers who rob celebrities' houses as they research them and find out when they will be away. It's not a good film technically, the performances are not theoretically good but the acting of every single character is just so fun to watch. They all have their special characteristics and they are all somewhat awkward teenagers and that's what Sofia Coppola is so good at to portray awkwardness, especially female awkwardness. And The Bling Ring which actually differs a lot from all her movies because it's not a direct depiction of loneliness but even though it's a least good film yet it's still not bad for someone who connects with her style. Number 6. The Beguiled The Beguiled is a very disturbing and unsettling tale of loneliness. It's the second film version of the novel by Thomas Cullinan about a wounded soldier's unexpected arrival at a girl's school where all of the ladies take care of him and simultaneously desire him for they have forever been alone and isolated in their lives. This is actually so dark but for a lot of parts it's funny. It is indeed an honest and realistic depiction of sexual desires, how the oppression of feelings makes people angry or dishonest and the whole atmosphere with the grey color palette adds more to its intense perplexity. Every single performance is outstanding although I wouldn't praise the screenplay for a lot of dialogues that didn't seem to connect with the scenes overall. The story and the modernized filmmaking fit well which makes me desire to read the book someday. I hope you like apple pie. Love apple pie. It's my favorite. Is that my recipe, Alicia? It is. I picked the apples. Number 5. On the Rocks. On the Rocks is a simple little drama about a woman trying to find out if her husband is cheating on her with the help of her old yet enthusiastic father. And that's all. The story has a bit of thrill but that's not the point. The point is the portrayal of honest true to life human interactions. All I find in Sofia Coppola films are grounded and relatable characters and this was no different. Especially the character of Bill Murray and also how the interactions with such a character usually be. I don't know why women get plastic surgery. Because of men like you. This is one of our least appreciated movies but I found almost no flaws in it. The performances are simple, Bill Murray's acting is the same as in her other two films with him. Rashida Jones' performance is apt but the beauty lies in its screenplay and cinematography. The camera captures the suburban atmosphere in a busy city so lavishly. The moments seem gorgeous and comforting despite the content of it being a bit upsetting. I think I'm going deaf. Really? <clears throat> I can hear everything fine. Except women's voices. The Virgin Suicides The Virgin Suicides has a typical teen romance story but is still the most unique of all if that makes sense. The more I think about it, the more I like it. Once again, it is based on a novel written by Jeffrey Eugenides, a story told by a group of male friends who get obsessed with five sisters secluded in their home by their prejudiced parents. I feel like the term beautifully disturbing may only fit with this movie, nothing else. The way it portrays teenage dilemmas, desires, hopelessness and hysteria is a treat to watch. Kristen Dunst plays the main sister of the five who despite their family's unwillingness chooses to follow her own fancies and falls in love with a handsome guy in school. And for that all of the sisters' lives take a good turn but only for a short while. 
For a lot of reasons, it is obvious how personally this film will hit its audience as it did to me. This marked T on all the features of being lonely as a teenager, the sadness, the subdued yearnings, the mundane depression, it understands it all. And not a lot of movies out there to do that. Number 3. Somewhere This is a film about a father vibing with his 11-year-old daughter and being lonely for 90 minutes straight and it's perfect. This is a film hard to praise and make meaningful positive comments for it so much more to feel than to watch. There is hardly any dialogue here. The film moves at the pace of a snail and yet it feels as if one of the finest portrayals of loneliness in movies since the year it came out. And the best part about these movies is how comforting they are. I wouldn't mind the stuff here going on for like 3 hours. As the opinions go with the previous two films, this as well is rich with down-to-earth character interactions. The chemistry between Elle Fanning and Stephen Roth is so sweet and beautiful and such chemistry makes any movie so engaging. The color grading is soft and the visuals are so engaging. There's nothing unique to add about it but it's just a beautiful comforting watch for 90 minutes that lingers with you for such a long time. Number 2. Mary Antoinette a biopic so gorgeous and glazy, Mary Antoinette carries its majestic nature for its entirety. I want biopics to be more like this, no sense of truthfulness but just how the character was as a person. Even though it's not an exact reflection of how Mary Antoinette was being the 19-year-old queen of mid-18th century France but an idea. To stylize such a figure, the last queen of France before the French Revolution is to embrace risk and, as usual, a lot won't connect with such a depiction but it worked on its every second for me. Kirsten Dunn's portrayal of the lonely, sexually frustrated queen is genius and my favorite performance of her putting melancholia in the second. The quirkiness of this character comes out as a wholly unique characteristic of a biopic and it simply works for me. The costumes are lavish, the colors are gorgeous and the funny undertones of royal culture are what make this technically great. But above all, it's the childish soul of this movie that is so priceless and impossible to embody. Let them eat cake. That's such nonsense. I would never say that. Number 1. Lost in Translation Lost in Translation, which is arguably her best film, is also my favorite one. It couldn't be anything else. Lost in Translation is the magnum opus of her obvious topic of loneliness centering on the connection between a rich actor and a young woman in Japan. They don't find themselves belonging there until they find a meaningful attachment with one another, although the relationship isn't meant to last longer than their time in the country. Besides the overtold saying about loneliness, Lost in Translation is actually so good at finding the beauty of Tokyo with its white shots of the gorgeous streets and the buildings or the cultural scenarios. And those visuals add more to the feeling it delivers. The moments are so valued and significant saying little to no much which is so impressive and also makes this a very rewatchable movie. I never liked it as much or even considered it one of my favorite movies until watching it three times in over three years. It speaks to me in languages most movies just don't. You're not hopeless.